Tales That Need To Be Told presents The Immortal by Jorge Luis Borges In London, in the first part of June of 1929, the antiqua dealer Joseph Cartaphilus of Smyrna offered the Princess of Losige the six volume in a small quarto of Pop's Iliad. The princess, on receiving books, she exchanged a few words with the dealer. He was a wasted, unerred man with a gray eyes and gray beard of singularity back features. He could express himself with fluency and ignorance in several languages. In a very few minutes, he went from French to English and to English to an enigmatic conjunction of Salonica Spanish and Macau Portuguese. In October, the princess heard from a passenger of the Zeus that Cartaphilus had died at the sea while returning to Smyrna and that he had been wounded on the island of Eos. In the last volume of the Iliad, she found this manuscript. The original is written in English and abounds in Latinism. The version we offer is literal. As far as I can recall, my labors began in a garden in Thebes, Hecatompilus, when Diocletian was emperor. I had served without glory in the recent Egyptian wars. I was tribune of a legion quarter at Berenice. Facing the Red Sea, fever and magic consumed many men who had magnanimously coveted the steel. The Mauritanians were vanquished. The land previously occupied by the rebel city was eternally dedicated to the Platonic gods. Alexandria once subdued, vainly implored Caesar mercy within a years of legend report victory, but I scarcely managed a glimpse of Mars' countenance. This privation pained me and perhaps caused me precipitously to undertake the discovery through fearful and diffuse deserts of the sacred city of the immortals. My labors began, I have it relate, in a garden in Thebes. All the night I was unable to sleep for something was struggling with my heart. I arose shortly before dawn. My slaves were sleeping. The moon was of the same color as the infinite sun. An exhausted and bloody horseman came from the east. A few steps from me he turned from his mount. In a faint, insatiable voice he asked me in Latin the name of the river bathing the city walls. I answered that it was Egypt, fed by the rains. No, there is the river I seek, the sacred river which cleanses men of death. Their blood surged from his breast. He told me that his homeland was a mountain on the other side of the Ganges, and on this mountain it was said that if one traveled to the west, where the world ends, he would reach the river whose waters grant immortality. He added that on his far bank the city of the immortal rises, which in bastions and amphitheaters and temples before dawn he died. But I had determined to discover the city and its river. Interrogated by the executioner, some Mauritanian prisoners confirmed the traveler's tale. Someone recalled the Elysian plain at the ends of the earth where men's lives are perdurable. Someone else depicts where the Pactolus rises, whose inhabitants lie from a century. In Rome, I talk with philosophers who felt that to extend man's life is to extend his agony and multiply his debts. I don't know if I ever believe in the city of the immortals. I think that then the task of finding it was sufficient. Flavius, proconsul of Hedulia, gave me 200 soldiers for the undertaking. I also recruit mercenaries to say they knew the roads were the first to desert. Later events have deformed inextricably the memory of the first day of our journey. We depart from Arisnoe and enter the burning desert. We cross the land of the troglodytes, who devour serpents and are ignorant of verbal commerce, that of garamans, who keep their women in common and feed on lions, that of the owl hills, who worship only Tartarus, we exhaust other deserts where the sun is black, where the traveler must usurp the hour of night, for the fervor of day is intolerable. From afar, I glimpse the mountain which gave its name to the ocean. On its sides grows the spurge plant, which counteracts poisons. 
on its peak, like the satyrs, a nation of fellow and savage men given to lewdness. That these barbarous regions where the earth is mother of monsters could shelter in the interior of a famous city seemed inconceivable to all of us. We continue our march, for it would have been dishonor to turn back. A few foolhardly men slept with their faces exposed to the moon, they burned with fever. In the corrupted water of the cisterns, other drank madness and death. Then the desertions began, and very shortly thereafter, mutinies. To repress them, I didn't hesitate to exercise severity. I proceed justly where a centurion warned me that, seditious, eager to avenge the crucifixion of one of their number, they were plotting my death. I fled from the camp with a few soldiers loyal to me, but I lost them in the desert, amid the sandstorm and the vast night. I was lacerated by a great and arrow. I wandered several days without finding water. Or maybe it was one enormous day multiplied by the sun, my thirst, or my fear of thirst. I left the route to judgment of my horse. In the dawn, the distant breeze led up into pyramids and towers. Intolerably, I dreamed of an exiguous and knitted labyrinth. In the center was a water jar, my hands almost touched it. My eyes could see it, but so intricate and perfect set were the curves that I knew I would die before reaching it. Finally became untangled from this nightmare, I found myself lying with my hands tied, in an oblong stone niche no larger than a common grave shallowly excavated in the sharp slope of a mountain. Its sides were damp, polished by the time rather than by human effort. I felt a painful troubling in my chest. I felt that I was burning with thirst. I looked at and shot feebly. At the foot of the mountain, an impure stream spread noiselessly, clogged with debris and sun. On the opposite bank, beneath the last sun or beneath the first, shone the evident city of the immortals. I saw walls, arch, facades, and fora, and the base was a stone plateau. A hundred or so irregular niche analogous to mine fur with the mountain and the valley. In the sands, there were shallow pits. From these miserable holes and from the niche, naked, grey-skinned, scraggly, bearded men emerge. I thought I recognized them. They belong to the bestial breed of troglodytes, those who infest the shores of the Arabian Gulfs and the caverns of Ethiopia. I was not amazed that they could not speak and they devoured the serpents. The urgency of my fears made me reckless. I calculate that I was some thirty feet from the sand, and I drew myself along down the slope, my eyes closed, my hands behind my back. I sank my bloody face into the dark water. I drank just as animal water themselves before losing myself again in sleep and delirium. I repeat inexplicably some words in Greek. The rich Trojans from Selea, who drinks the black water of the Isepos. I don't know how many days and nights turn above me aching, unable to regain the shelter of the caverns, naked on the unknown sand, I let the moon and the sun gamble with my unfortunate destiny. The troglodytes, infantile in their barbarity, didn't aid me to survive or to die. In vain I begged them to put me to that. One day I broke my bandings on an edge of flint. Another day I got up and managed to beg or steal. Yes. I am Marcus Flaminus Rufus, military tribune of the Rome's legions. I still my fierce detested portion of serpent flesh. My covetousness to see the immortals, to touch the superhuman city almost keep me from sleep. And as if they penetrated my purpose, neither the throttle did sleep. At first I inferred that they were watching me. Later, that I had become contaminated by my uneasiness. Much as dog may do. To leave the barbarous village, I choose the most public of ours, the coming of Ebony, when almost all the men emerge from the crevices and pits and look at the setting sun as if they were not seeing it. I prayed out loud, 
less as a supplication to defend favor than as an intimidation of the tribe with articulate words. I crossed the stream clutched by the dunes and headed toward the city. Confusedly, two or three men followed me. They were like the others of that breed of slight stature. They didn't inspire fear, but rather repulsion. I had to skirt several irregular arrivings which seemed to me like quarries. Obfuscated by the city grandeur, I had towed it nervy. Toward midnight, I set foot upon the black shadow of its walls, wrestling out in idolatrous forms on the yellow sand. I was held by a kind of sacred horror. Novelty and the desert are so abhorred by man that I was glad one of the troglodytes had followed me to the last. I closed my eyes and awaited without sleeping the light of day. I have said that the city was founded on a stone plateau. This plateau, comparable to a high cliff, was no less arduous than the walls. In vain, I fatigued myself. The black base didn't disclose the slightest irregularity. The invariable walls seemed not to admit a single door. The force of the sun obliged me to seek refuge in a cave. In the rear was a pit. In the pit, a stair which we sank down abysmality into the darkness below. I went down through a chaos of sordid galleries. I reached a vast circular chamber, scarcely visible. There were nine doors in this cellar. Eight led to a labyrinth that treacherously returned to the same chamber. The nine draw another labyrinth, and then led to a second circular chamber equal to the first. I didn't know the total of these chambers. My misfortune and anxiety multiplied them. The silence was hostile and almost perfect. There was no sound in this deep stone network, save that of a subterranean wind, whose cause I did not discover. Noiselessly, the tiny stream of rusty water disappeared between the crevices. Horribly, I became habituated to this doubtful world. I found it incredible that there could be anything but cellars with nine doors and long branched out cellars. I don't know how long I must have walked beneath the ground. I know, I once confused in the same nostalgia, the atrocious village of the barbarians and my native city amid the clusters. In the depths of a corridor, an unforeseen wall halted me, a remote light fell from above. I raised my confused eyes. In the vertiginous, extreme heights, I saw a circle of the sky so blue that it seemed purple. Some metal ranks scaled the wall. I was limp with fatigue, but I climbed up. Stopping only at times to sob clumsily with joy, I began to glimpse capitals and astragals, triangular pediments and bolts, confused pigeons of granite and marble. Thus, I was afforded this ascension from the blind region of dark interwoven labyrinths into the resplendent city. I emerged into a kind of little square, or rather, a kind of courtyard. It was surrounded by a single building of irregular form and variable height. To this heterogeneous building belonged the different cupolas and columns, rather than by any other trait of this incredible monument. I was held by the extreme edge of its fabrication. I felt that it was older than mankind, than the earth. This manifest antiquity, though in some way terrible to the eyes, seems to me in keeping with the work of the immortal builders. At first, cautiously, later, indifferently, and last, desperately, I wander up the stairs and along the pavements of the inextricable palace. Afterwards, I learned that the width and the height of the steps were not constant, a fact which made me understand the singular fatigue they produced. This palace is a fabrication of the gods, I thought at the beginning. I explored the uninhabited interiors and corrected myself. The gods who built it have died. I noted specularities and said, the gods who built it were mad. I said it, I know, with an incomprehensible reprobation which was almost remorse, with more intellectual horror than palpable fear. To the impression of enormous antiquity, others were added. That of the interminable, that of the atrocious, that of the complexly senseless. I had crossed a labyrinth, but the needed city of the immortals filled me with fright and repugnance. A labyrinth is a structure compounded to confuse men. Its architecture, which in symmetries, 
subordinated to that end. In the palace, I imperfectly explored the architecture lacked any such finality. It abounded in dead end corridors, high untainable windows, portentous doors which led to a cell or pit, incredible inverted stairways whose step and balustrades contain guards. Other stairways climbing early to the sides of a monumental wall would die without letting anywhere after making two or three turns in the lofty darkness of the cupolas. I don't know if all the examples I have enumerated are literal. I know that, for many years, they infested my nightmares. I am no longer able to know if such and such a details is a transcription of reality or of the forms which I unhanged my nights. This city, I tell, is so horrible that in mere existence and perdurance, though in the midst of a secret desert, contaminate the past and the future, and in some way, even jeopardize the stars. As long as it lasts, no one in the world can be strong or happy. I do not want to describe it. If I try, they only come cows of heterogeneous world, the body of a tiger or a bull in which teeth, organs and heads monstrously pullulate in a mutual conjunction and hatred, can, perhaps, be approximate images. I do not remember the stage of my return, mid the dust and damp hypogea. I only know I was not abandoned by the fear that when I left the last labyrinth, I would again be surrounded by the nefarious city of the immortals. I can remember nothing else. This oblivion, now insuperable, was perhaps voluntary. Perhaps the circumstances of my escape were so unpleasant that, on some day no less forgotten as well, I swore to forget them. Those who have heard the account of my labors with attention will recall that a man from a tribe followed me as a dog made up to the irregular shadow of the walls. When I came out of the last cellar, I found him at the mouth of the cave. He was stretched out on the sand, where he was tracing clumsily and erasing a string of signs that, like the letters in our dreams, seemed on the verge of being understood and then dissolved. At the first, I thought it was some kind of primitive writing. I saw it was absurd to imagine that men who have not attained to a spoken word could attain to writing. Besides, none of the forms was equal to another, which excluded or lessened the possibility that they were symbolic. The man would trace them, look at them and correct them, suddenly, as if he were annoyed by the game, he raised them with his palm up forearm. He looked at me and seemed not to recognize me. However, so great was the relief which engulfed me, or so great and fearful was my loneliness, that I suppose this rudimentary troglodyte to looking up at me from the floor of the cave had been waiting for me. The sun hid the plain when we began the return to the village. Beneath the fierce stars, the sun hid the plain when we began the return to the village beneath the fierce stars. The sun burned under our feet. The troglodyte went ahead. That night, I conceived the plan of teaching him to recognize and perhaps to repeat a few words. The dog and the horse, I reflect, are capable of the former, and many fears like Caesar Nightingale's of the latter. No matter how crude a man's mind may be, it will always be superior to that of irrational creatures. The humility and wretchedness of the troglodyte brought to my memory the image of Argos, the more even old dog in the Odyssey, and so I gave him the name Argus and tried to teach it to him. I failed over and again. Conciliation, rigor, and obstinacy were complete in vain, motionless with lifeless eyes. He seemed not to perceive the sounds I tried to press upon him. A few steps from me, he seemed to be very distant, lying on the sand like a small rhinoceros lava sphinx. He let the heavens turn above him from the twilight of dawn till that of evening. I judged it impossible that he not be aware of my purpose. I recalled that among the Ethiopians, it is well known that monkeys deliberately do not speak, so they will not be obligated to work. 
and I attribute Argo's silence to suspicion or fear. From that imagination I went to others, even more extravagant. I thought that Argos and I participate in different universes. I thought that our perceptions were the same, but that he combined them in another way and made other objects of them. I thought that perhaps there were no objects for him, only a vertiginous and continuous play of extremely brief impressions. I thought of a world without memory. Without time, I consider the possibility of a language without nouns, a language of impersonal verbs or indeclinable epithets. Thus, the day went on dying, and with them, the years. But something akin to happiness happened one morning. It rained. It rained with powerful deliberation. Desert nights can be cold, but that night had been fire. I dreamed that a river in the Thessaly, to whose water I had returned a goldfish, This river came to rescue me over the red sun of Black Rock, and I heard it approach. Then, the coolness of the air and the buzzing murmur of the rain awoke me. I ran naked to meet it. Night was fading. Beneath the yellow clothes, the tribe, no less joyful than I, offered themselves to the vivid downpour in a kind of ecstasy. They seemed like Corybantus possessed by the divinity. Argos. His eyes turned toward the sky, drowning. Torrents ran down his face, not only of water, but I later learned of tears. Argos! I cried, Argos! Then, with gentle admiration, as if he were discovering something lost and forgotten a long time ago, Argos stammered this world. Argos, who is dog. And then, also without looking at me, this dog lying in the manure. We accept reality easily, perhaps because we intuit that nothing is real. I asked him what he knew of the Odyssey. The exercise of Greek was painful for him. I had to repeat the question. Very little, less than the poorest rhapsodist. It must be a thousand and one hundred years since I invented it. Everything was elucidated for me that day. The troglodytes were the immortals. The rivulet of sandy water, the river saw by the horsemen. As for the city whose renown had spread as far as the Ganges, it was some nine centuries since the immortal had raised it with the relics of its ruins. They erect in the same place, the mad city I have traversed. A kind of parody or an inversion and also a temple of the irrational gods who govern the world and of whom we know nothing, save that they do not resemble man. This establishment was the last symbol to which the mortal condescended. It marks a stage at which judging that all undertakings are in vain, they determine to live in thought, in pure speculation. They erect their structure, forgot it, and went to the dwell in the caves. Absorbed in doubt, they hardly perceived the physical world. These things were told me by Homer, as one who speak to a child. He also relate to me his old age and the last voyage he undertook, moved as was Ulysses, by the purpose of reaching the men who don't know what the sea is, nor it meets seasoned with salt, nor suspect what an ore is, He lived for a century in the city of the immortals. When it was raised, he advised that the other be founded. This should not surprise us. It is famous that after singing of the war of Ilion, he sang of the war of the frogs and the mice. He was like a god who might create the cosmos and then create a chaos. To be immortal is commonplace. Except for man, all creators are immortal, for they are ignorant of death. What is divine, terrible, incomprehensible is to know that one is immortal. I have noted that, in spite of religions, this conviction is very rare. Israelites, Christians, Muslims profess immortality, 
but the veneration they render this world proves they believe all in it, since they destine all the worlds in infinite number to be its reward or punishment. The will of certain Hindustani religions seem more reasonable to me, and this will, which has neither begin nor end, each life is the effect of the preceding and engenders the following, but none determines the totality. Indoctrinated by a practice of centuries, the Republic of Immortal Men had attained the perfection of tolerance and almost that indifference. They knew that, in an infinite period of time, all things happened to all men. Because of his past or future virtues, every man is worthy of all goodness, but also of all perversity, and that is because of his infamy in the past or the future. Thus, just as in games of chance, and even numbers tend to war equilibrium, so also weight and stolidity cancel out and correct each other. And perhaps the rustic poem of the seed is a counterbalance demanded by one single epithet from the Eclogus or by an epigram of Heraclitus. The most fleeting thoughts obeys an invisible design and can crown or inaugurate a sacred form. I know of those who have done evil so that in future centuries good will result or will have resulted in those already past. Seen in this manner, all our acts are just, but they are also indifferent. There are no moral or intellectual merits. Homer composed the Odyssey. If we postulate an infinite period of time with an infinite circumstance and change, the impossible thing is not to compose the Odyssey at least once. No one is anyone. One single immortal man is all men. Like Cornelius Agrippa, I am God, I am a hero, I am a philosopher, I am a demon, and I am a world, which is a tedious way of saying that I do not exist. The concept of the world as a system of precise compensation influenced the immortal vastly. In the first place, it made them invulnerable to pity. I have mentioned the ancient quarries which broke the fields on the other bank. A man once fell headlong into the deepest of them. He could not hurt himself or die, but he was burning with thirst. Before they threw him a rope, seventy years went by. Neither were they interested in their own fate. The body for them was a submissive domestic animal, and it sufficed to give it every month the pittance of few hours of sleep, a bit of water, and a scrap of meat. Let no one reduce us to the status of ascetics. There is no pleasure more complex than of thought, and we surrender ourselves to it. At times, an extraordinary stimulus will restore us to the physical world. For example, that morning, the old elementary joy of the rain. Those lapses were quite rare. All the immortals were capable of perfect quietude. I remember one who I never saw stand up and he had a beard nested on his breast. Among the corollaries of doctrine that there is nothing unlike in compensation in something else, there is one whose theoretical importance is very small, but which induces toward the end or the beginning of the 10th century to disperse ourselves over the face of the earth. It can be stated in these words, there exists a river whose water grant immortality. In some region, there must be another river whose waters remove it. The number of rivers are not infinite, an immortal traveler who traverses the world will finally, someday, have drunk from all of them. We propose to discover that river. Death or its solutions make men precious and pathetic. They are moving because of their phantom condition. Every act they execute may be their last. There is not a face that is not on the verge of dissolving like a face in a dream. Everything among the mortals has the value of the irretrievable and the perilous. Among the mortals, on the other hand, every act and every thought is the echo of others that preceded in the past. 
with no visible beginning or the faithful presage of others that in the future will repeat into a vertiginous degree. There is nothing that is not as if lost in a maze of indefatigable mirrors. Nothing can happen only once. Nothing is preciously precarious. The elegiacal, the serious, the ceremonial do not hold for the immortals. Omer and I separated at the gates of Tangier, I think. We didn't even say goodbye. I traveled over new kingdoms, new empires. In the fall of 1066, I fought at Stamford Bridge. I do not recall whether in the force of Harold, who was not long in finding his destiny, or in those of the hapless Harald Hadrata, who conquered six feet of English soil, or a bit more. In the seventh century of Ahira, in the suburb of Ulak, I transcribed with mesuret calligraphy in a language that I had forgotten in an alphabet that I do not know, the seven adventures of Simbad and the history of the city of bronze. In the courtyard of Jelly in Samarkand, I played a great deal of chess. In Bikaner, I professed the science of astrology and also in Bohemia. In 1638, I was at Kolosbar and later at Leipzig. In Aberdeen in 1714, I subscribed to the sixth volume of Pop Iliad. I know that I frequented its page with delight. About 1729, I discussed the origin of that poem with a professor of rhetoric named, I think, uh, Gian Battista. His arguments seemed to me irrefutable. In the 4th of October of 1921, the Patna, which was taking me to Bombay, had to cast an anchor in a port of the Eritrean coast. I went ashore and recalled other very ancient mornings, also facing the Red Sea, when I was a tribune of Rome and fever and magic and idleness consumed the soldiers. On the outskirts of the city, I saw a spring of clear water. I tested it, prompted by habit. When I came up the bank, a spinny fush lacerated the back of my hand. The unusual pain seemed very active to me. Incredulous, speechless and happy, I contemplate the precious formation of a slow drop of blood. Once again, I am mortal. I repeated to myself, once again, I am like all men. That night I slept until dawn. After a year's time, I have inspected this page. I am certain they reflect the truth. But in the first chapters, and even in certain paragraphs of the others, I seem to perceive something false. This is perhaps produced by the abuse of circumstantial details, a procedure I learned from the poets which contaminates everything with falsity. Since those details can have bound in their realities but not in their recollection, I believe that I have discovered a more intimate reason. I shall write it no matter if I am just fantastic. The story I have narrated seems unreal because, in it, are mixed the events of two different men. In the first chapter, the horseman wants to know the name of the river bathing in the walls of Thebes, Flaminius Rufus, who before has applied to the city the epithet of Hecatompilos, says that the river is the Egypt. None of this locution is proper to him, but rather to Homer who makes express mention in the Iliad of Thebes Hecatempilos, and who in the Odyssey, by the way of Proteus and Ulysses, in Variable say, Egypt for the Nile. In the second chapter, the Roman, upon drinking the immortal water, utters some words in Greek. These words are Homeric and may be sowed at the end of the famous catalogue of the ships. Later, in the vertiginous palace, he speaks of a reprobation which was almost remorse, this words belong to Homer, who had projected that horror. Such anomalies disquiet me. Others of an aesthetic order permit me to discover the truth. They are contained in the last chapter. There it is writing that I fought at Stamford Bridge. 
that I transcribe in Bulak the travels of Sinbad the sailor and that I subscribe in Aberdeen to the English Iliad of Poe. One reads, in Terralia, in Vicander I profess the science of astrology and also in Bohemia, none of these testimony is false. What is significant is that they are stressed. The first of them seems proper to a warrior, but later ones note that the narrator does not linger over warlike deeds, but does over the fates of men. Those which follow are even more curious. A dark elemental reason of like me to record them, I did it because I knew they were pathetic. Spoken by a Roman Flaminus Rufus, they are not. They are spoken by Homer. It is strange that the latter should copy in the 13th century the adventures of Sinbad and other Ulysses and, and should discover after many centuries in another kingdom and a barbarous tongue the forms of his Iliad. As for the sentence containing the name of Bicaner, one can see that it was fabricated by a man of letters desirous of exhibiting splendid words. When the end draws near, there no longer remain any remembered images, only words remain. It is not strange that time should have confused the words that once represent me for those that were symbols of the fates of he who accompanied me for so many centuries. I have been Homer, shortly I shall be no one like Ulysses, shortly I shall be all men, I shall be dead. Postscript 1950, among the commentaries afflicted by the preceding publication, the most curious, if not the most urbane, is biblically entitled A Coat of Many Colors, and it's the work of the most tenacious pen of the Dr. Nahum Cordobero. It comprises some 100 pages. The author speaks of Rit Santos, of the Santos of the late Latinity of Ben Johnson, who defined his contemporaries with bits of Seneca, of the Virgilius and Vagelinsons, of Alexander Rose, of the artifice of George Moore and Eliot, and finally, of the narrative attribute to the antiquity dealer Joseph Cartaphilus. He denounced in the first chapter brief interpolation from Historia Naturalis of Pliny, in the second, writings from Thomas de Quincy. In the theme from an epistle of Descartes to the ambassador Piers Chanut. In the fourth, back to Methuselah from Bernard Shaw. He infers from these instructions or thefts that the whole document is apocryphal. In my opinion, such a conclusion is inadmissible. When the end draws near, growled Cartaphilus, there no longer remain any remembered images, only words remain. Words, displaced and mutilated words, words of others, were the poor pittance left him by the hours and the centuries. Hello, my dear immortals. Thank you for joining us in Tales That Need To Be Told. This work from Jorge Luis Borges was dedicated to Cecilia Ingenieros. In it, we can rethink the scenario of immortality that we probably have already considered in other occasions. Most likely, as many others, I would like to have a long life and in a good physical condition. <laughs> but still, in the best human conditions, what will be the limit for our brain? What will be the limit to keep all memories? And how long it will be life now. I would like you to tell me in the comments if you will drink the water from the river of the immortals. I have said, under these conditions where there is a possibility of finding a river that could make it reversible, I must accept that I will not hesitate to do so, because it will give the power to determine when will be the end of my days. Also, imagine the number of stories, of tales, that I could share over the years. And if you see my digital library, I won't have enough life to read every book in the folders. 
Remember, if you want to support this podcast to continue for a long time, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, click on the bell, leave comments, likes, and please share our content. This will help us to get more and more people. You can share it in the link of YouTube or in the link in Spotify. If you want to tell us a story, send it to tales at ernestodelavega.com. It can be fiction or reality. If you have any content project and believe that there could be a good collaboration between us, send your idea to the same address. You can support us on patreon.com slash Ernesto de la Vega. We also invite you to join our Facebook group. Thank you for listening to this podcast. For today, I have to say goodbye, but see you in the next podcast. I am Ernesto de la Vega.